but we were sitting there, and and the guy uh, realized that I was a pastor, asked me what I do for a living, and, and all of a sudden, all the language shifted to like religious language. Um, and he talked about how I could serve others by buying this timeshare and inviting them to the And he literally used these words. Oh. He preached the gospel of relaxation, uh -huh. and. Uh, and he offered a very expensive uh, road to an endless vacation, which the whole time I'm sitting there going, and then he started talking about the vacation lifestyle. That was his tagline, <laughs> have a vacation lifestyle. And I was thinking, is it really vacation if it's all the time? <laughs> I, I don't think that it, it's vacation anymore at that point. Um, it's retirement. <laughs> but, but the question rose up in me this week, is this the good life? Is this, we've been talking about freedom now for two months. Is this the freedom that, that I've been preaching about for the last two months is, is sitting here on a beach in Mexico. <laughs> and, um, and I realized not even close, not even close. I would way rather be here with you all um, than there forever. John 10.10, 10, it's, it's the scripture that I, I feel like the gospel hangs on and it says, um, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Well, what's the good life? What's this full life look like? Um, as nice as vacation was, um, I realized if I stayed there long, my world would collapse down into smaller and smaller pieces. It would mostly be about me and my relaxation and my comfort. Um, and I don't think that's the good life. Um, it's a carefree kind of fake version of, of the good life. It's not how Jesus describes the good life. Um, the good life, according to Jesus, is, is the opportunity to walk with God, to be available, um, to be a part of what he's doing in the world, and, and to be available to other people. Uh, one of my seminary professors said something that stuck with me once. He said, um, the best week you could ever imagine would be a week where you never had to think about yourself even once. <coughs> I was too busy, caught up in God and his wonder, and too busy being available to other people. It's a beautiful picture of what freedom actually looks like. It's a better life. And so we're going we're gonna to look at a passage that describes how to get to that better life um, and how to especially get through some of the harder stuff on the way there. And it's, it's Hebrews chapter 12. Um, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to jump down to Paul's application of it in verses 12 and 13. So let me read it for us here reason I use bookmarks. Cool. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, he scorned its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so you will not grow weary and lose heart. And then the application, he says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather yield. Um, Paul is writing to the Hebrews, and they are going through difficult times. Um, and Paul is saying that freedom doesn't always come easy. The journey of faith, um, he describes as a long-distance race. Any of you ever run cross-country? It, it, it can be a painful experience. Um, but he also describes it as one full of joy. A similar image might be taking a long hike. Um, if you ever go on a long hike, the view isn't always awesome. <clears throat> and there are definitely spots where the backpack feels awfully heavy, um, where the view is not wonderful. But when you get to the top, when you get to the fulfillment of it, it's often breathtaking and amazing, and, and you don't regret having made the journey. So. And Christian life is a lot like that. Um, it's full of joy. It's neat to see God do stuff and, and to have God enter into your life. Um, <clears throat> It's exciting to see those moments of fulfillment, and, and we're headed for an incredible one uh, where we get to be with God forever. But the journey isn't always easy, and there are tough steps. In uh, Boy Scouts, my dad was a Boy Scout leader, and I was obligatorily put in Boy Scouts. And one of the cool things that we did while we were in Boy Scouts was we were going to make a hike up Mount Whitney, which is a big 
mountain. It's like the highest one in the lower 48. 14,000 feet climb, I don't think we summited it. There's no way us little 11-year-olds did that. Uh, but we definitely hiked up at a ways. And I remember a few months before the hike, they invited us to like come and come with your backpack packed with the clothes that you were gonna wear while you were on the trip. And then they would help us kind of look at what we've got and then they would show us some pictures of where we were going. Pictures were phenomenal, like pictures of half dome and stuff. I'm like, wow, this is cool. We get to go see that. Um, but then uh, I learned a few things that night about my, my attempts at hiking. One was that my running shoes weren't gonna do it. I would actually need hiking boots. Um, I learned that my backpack weighed twice as much as it should for somebody my size and um, that I would probably need to start doing some pre-hikes to maybe try to attempt to get ready for this, that it wasn't good to just set out and, and make this happen one day. Um, and had I skipped that night, as some other scouts did, I, I doubt I would have made the climb with them. Um, a number of scouts kind of turned back halfway and said, man, I, I'm just not ready for this. Yeah. And this passage is, is similar to what Paul is doing um, with us. He's saying, I've made the journey before. Let me show you how to make it. Here's some tips on how you can get ready for it so that you get prepared uh, to enter into the joy and the full life that God has for you. And his first piece of advice um, is a really simple one, and yet it's one that our culture doesn't always understand. And, and it's this, that uh, the journey of faith is not a solo journey. Um, you have to have a team. First one, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the folks around you are your crucial strength in the moments um, when you want to quit. Um, when you uh, start to get off track, when you're, when you're headed in the wrong direction, it's, it's the cloud of witnesses who can bring you back. And um, We need to expand that definition a little bit. It's not just necessarily people we know, but we can know other people who have gone before, maybe authors or um, biographies of folks or routines uh, the Wednesday morning is a big part of my routine of like hey this keeps me on track if I, if I start to get off track this is where I'm at on Wednesday mornings um, but these folks remind me that I'm not alone in this journey there's a great cloud of people and we're not all strong all at the same time but I remember um, sitting down with my brother and his wife and we were talking about faith and she said well I consider myself a Christian which I thought strange because I had never ever seen them do anything having to do with Christianity whatsoever. Um, so, but I consider myself a Christian, but, I, I'm, but faith is a private matter. It's not something that we, we talk about or do with anybody else. And um, it reminds me of this sort of idea uh, of, of folks that's become more and more prevalent. Um, some are in my family that say, um, I consider myself a Christian. I just, I just do it um, not in a community sort of way. I don't really need a church. I don't need a community of other people. I just sort of uh, grab onto some things of Jesus along the way. And, and uh, so I consider myself a Christian. Um, and, uh, and it's weird because we start to make God in our own image when we do it. We don't have anybody else to bounce it off of. We, we're living in a little silo. And, and really, none of us live in a silo. It's the people around us that shape our culture. Um, it's a strange thing. I call it the air we breathe, um, which nice because of the song. Um, but the air you breathe, it, it, you never think about it, but you're always breathing it. And that's, it sort of represents the assumptions that we have about who God is and, and the way to do spirituality. And um, it's our compass on where we're going and what it is we're doing. And the people around us shape that. They create the norm. I remember I went to this um, communications conference. And I was a receptionist at the time, so they paid for me to go to this conference to learn how to speak properly to people. And uh, the funny thing about it was uh, half the room was like folks who were doing reception work. The other half of the room was like construction guys. They were like in construction management. And um, this debate broke out between them and the instructor about whether or not it was okay to swear at work. Because that was the culture. Like, that was the air that they were breathing. Like, this is just how you talked. And uh, if you talked the way the instructor was suggesting, you wouldn't be a part of that culture anymore. There was something there. There's something about 
how the things around us shape us. Um, that timeshare presentation I went to, um, Christina and I got talked into another one of those back when we were in Las Vegas visiting my brother once. And um, tickets for a show, man, never worth it. I finally got her to agree, it's never worth it. Um, but in Vegas, it was like, high entertainment, high energy, like, this is gonna be the funnest thing that you ever do, and they just hammered on us for like three hours until we were so tired, we're like, fine, just sign us up, I don't even care how much it costs, just get me out of this room. Um, can we have our tickets now? Uh, but then in Mexico, it was totally different. The guy was like super chilled and relaxed, and he's like, how does this fit into your retirement? And I'm like, I'm not even close to retirement right now, man, I don't know. I don't even take vacations, so uh, so it was just a, a it was a different culture. Um, if we want to make the most of our faith, if we want to make a journey uh, that lasts. One of the best ways to do it is to surround yourself with some people who will create a culture of following Jesus. One of the first scriptures I ever memorized was Ecclesiastes four nine and ten, and it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for the work. Isn't that true? If you're working with somebody, you're going to work probably better and get more done. Um, and then it says this, uh, Woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. And that's also true. If we're running solo, not sharing our lives with anybody else, um, when we hit on a hard time, it's, it's awful hard to get back up again. There's no one there to help us. Um, I used to do cross-country running in high school. I did it a couple years. Doesn't look like it now, but believe it or not, I did at one point. Um, and uh, I didn't stay in shape the whole year for cross-country running. Uh, I had to get ready every year to do it. And so in August, I would start to do the runs. I would start to do a mile or maybe two miles, because by the time that practice started, you had to be up at like five and seven miles. And August was the worst month to run because it was hot out and I was alone. And there were a lot of days where I'm like, get a good start, and then I'm like, oh, too hot, I'm gonna walk a while. Oh, there's a store I wanna go to, and then my ADD would kick in. And, uh, or I'd be like, oh, it's raining. No, nah, I'm not running today, that's not gonna happen. Um, but then when September hit, it was totally different, because there was the team, the other folks to run with. It didn't matter if it was raining, we ran. And uh, when we got tired, we didn't walk because the whole team was running and um, and then on race day man race day was good we had four teams we had varsity and junior varsity and we had the men's team and the women's team and um, we would position ourselves at different places on the track the hardest spots and right when you just wanted to quit running there was like four teammates there going you can do this you got this and they would cheer you on and and especially if it was a pretty girl, I remember being able to run a little bit further, a little bit harder. But, um, but we need each other to cheer ourselves on. We need it uh, when the times get hard to have somebody there who can encourage you and, and uh, cause you to run another step. Um, I know for me that's worked out a lot in small groups. Our church definitely has them. I have room in mine on Tuesday nights. Shameless plug. Um, <laughs> But it could be anything. It could be going out for lunch after church. It could be uh, meeting up with somebody that you see who's going in the right direction and going, hey, I need to spend some time with you. Um, but we're not supposed to do it alone. And, and there's a part of our culture that says you're on your own. Um, so be a part of a team. Um, and that, that air we breathe is a big deal. Um, there are lies all around us of what the good life is. Um, that's what advertising is built on. I remember down in Mexico, I hopped on the bus. We didn't. We weren't going to pay a taxi. Like taxi was like fifty bucks to get to town. I'm like, uh huh. Yeah, I can ride the bus for like five bucks and get to see the people who actually live there, which is cooler for me. So I'm sitting on the bus and there's this big screen, and it talked about something called the mango deck, and it showed a bunch of people just getting hammered uh, on this deck. And, and then the punchline of the ad came forward and it was, your best self. <laughs> and I thought, that's weird. I don't know if that looks like my best self if I were to put myself in that picture. Um, I don't think it'd be very pretty. Uh, 
Paul says this, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin, and that's uh, broken patterns and lies and baggage and stuff that just easily entangles us in it. And it's already a part of our lives. It, it comes from growing up in a broken world. Um, it comes from bad choices we make and other people make. It's fall right now, and, um, and these leaves that at my house have started to change color. And I noticed there's these big giant leaves and they are crawling over different bushes they're crawling up a tree, and I didn't notice them before until they started changing color. Um, there are these big, giant leaves, and they crawl over, and they just choke out the plants and take it over. And I went to go take this thing off of it. I figured I would just lift it off and, and maybe cut it. It is wound up tight. Tendrils of it come out and wind up around the branches, and it takes some doing to even get it off if you can't. And Paul's saying, let's unwind that stuff that's entangling us. Um, and instead, throw it off and run the race that Jesus has laid out for us. It's a marathon. It, it's not a sprint, and we need each other. I know a lot of folks who've gotten a blazing start, but aren't, aren't there anymore. Um, one of them is a friend of mine. He's a, um, he's a pastor who set out to plant a church in... Capitol Hill, and um, it was an ambitious goal. He had had a profound experience with God in South Africa, and then he came here and decided to plant a church there. And I remember um, him telling me, I love these people. Well, um, these are my people, but I have yet to meet a single other person who shares my belief and hope in Jesus. Which was interesting. Um, but the tricky part is that pretty soon after him saying that, I remember he quit coming to our gatherings. He um, stopped having church because there was only a couple people coming. And um, the last time I heard, he had decided that he didn't believe in Jesus anymore. He didn't want to run that race. He, was, he gave up on it. Um, and I think it's because he did it solo. And I hope God brings him back. There's this idea that came up for me right around the time that we got um, the elections going. And it's, a, it's of a cabinet. Uh, it's a group of people that you surround yourself with, that you trust their input and perspective and expertise and wisdom. Um, and they help you. And I think we all need a cabinet. Um, Jesus is fantastic. But we need other people around us that we can see that can encourage us when it's hard to hear. So that's the first piece um, of advice Paul gives. And the second one is, is uh, another running part of that analogy. He says, um, fix your eyes on Jesus. Run in the right direction. Um, in cross country, when I was running, one of the tricks that they taught us was, uh, look at the guy ahead of you. Um, Focus on him and then just try to pass him and there'll be somebody else that you can focus on uh, so that you can keep running ahead. Um, a similar thing happens when you're trying to walk a balance beam. Uh, if you try to look down at your feet, if you're, if you're thinking about what's behind you or you're focused on right where you are, uh, it's really, really hard to stay balanced that way. The best thing you can possibly do is, is look ahead at some point farther on ahead of you and then focus on walking there. And you'll walk incredibly more stable. Um, fix your eyes on Jesus and where he went. He faced difficulty. He faced scorn. He faced even death. Um, and yet he's seated at the right hand of God uh, in joy. Uh, there's a great movie, Up. You ever see that movie, Up? It's fantastic. And my favorite part of that movie, the part that I just want to stop and rewind and act like a little kid and watch it 200 times, is the part where they meet the dog. And the dog's like, the dog has a collar on that can help him talk so that the dog can communicate. And the dog says wonderful dog-like things like, I know I've just met you, but I already love you. And um, my master is fantastic. He made this collar for me. And then right in the middle of a sentence, he goes, squirrel. And um, that is me. <laughs> I am cruising along on track and then all of a sudden squirrel. Um, 
And I do that in my faith too. I'm like cruising along. I got a good stride. I'm, I'm, I'm headed in the right direction. Then I'll squirrel. And I just get distracted. And then it, it can be a day or two. And I'm like, well, where was I going? I forgot. Um, it's hard to stay fixed on it. Uh, speaking of squirrels, because I'm on a tangent and squirrels. Um, <coughs> there was this one day that we were we were driving out of our out of our house and um, Gabby saw a squirrel and she is bred to chase squirrels, my little dog. Um, bred to chase squirrels and we had the windows down because it was summer and it was hot. And sure enough, as we're driving, Gabby launches right out the window um, to go chase the squirrel. Christina's freaking out because um, her baby just jumped out the window of a moving car, understandably. And um, man, it's so easy to do that. You get caught up in something and just pull off track. The faith journey is like that. Uh, we can get going in the right direction on what the good life is. We get convinced in some moment that following Jesus is the right way to go. But then other things begin to creep in and we go, man, I want that. I want the boat. I want to go on another vacation. I want, I want a new car. That would be awesome. Uh, we get distracted by things instead of going, where does God want me to be? Uh, there's a really powerful moment in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus has just said some really hard words. He's talked about, uh, if you want to be a part of this, you have to eat my body and drink my blood. Uh, he's talking about communion and, and his death. And a bunch of people are like, you know what? Jesus was great to follow when he was like healing people and making food happen for everybody. And we were having a great party. And now he's talking about hardship. And suffering and stuff and weird stuff and I don't get him and uh, and they bail out and Jesus looks around and he, he turns to his disciples and he goes you guys gonna leave me too and Peter says the most amazing thing it's John 6 68 if you ever want to find it in your Bible underline it highlight it uh, and blazon it on your heart and he says this he says where else would we go Lord you alone have the words of eternal life where else would we go? You're the good life. Where would we go to find that? Where would we go to find this full eternal life? Don't get entangled. Don't get distracted. Fix your eyes. And then for the moments when your eyes have gotten unfixed on Jesus, there's this beautiful thing that happened in his death. And it's the thing that we sing about a lot. And it's grace. Um, when you're hiking and you get off trail uh, and you get lost and you get distracted, it's really, really sometimes hard to find your way back to the trail. Everything just looks foreign. Um, grace is like this ever with us on ramp. Get right back on track. Get fixed back on. There's been a couple of times where, where I really wanted to quit my faith. They both involved um, significant heartbreak, I realized. One was a, a relational heartbreak, um, relationship melted down that I put a lot of hope in. Um, the other was, was a career one. I had a really rough patch in ministry, and I'm like, done with church, done with it. I, I don't want to do this God stuff anymore. I just want to go off and live my life. And... Um, both times, what brought me back was re-looking at Jesus and coming to the conclusion Peter did. Where else would I go? You have the words of eternal life, God. Um, whether you're brand new, whether you've been on the road a while, whether you're distracted or whether you're not, whether this is an easy time or a hard time, I want to invite you to re-look at who Jesus is. Read the Gospels. Let him win you over again. Because what it will do is it will breathe new life and new focus and you will see something about him you never saw before. Um, and it will strengthen you because you're fixing your eyes in the right place. Which brings me to the last bit. Verses 12 and 13. Strengthen your feeble arms and knees. Make a straight path so that you're healed rather than disabled. Um, strengthening is not something I like to do. It involves working out. Uh, <laughs> It's not my favorite thing to do. But I notice that when I'm strong, <coughs> when I'm strengthened, um, I can withstand 
the, the bumps and the struggles and the difficulties a little bit better. When I go and do some work around the house, I'm not exhausted. And when I strengthen my marriage, Christina and I get along a lot better. When I strengthen, um, if, if a church is strengthened or a company is strengthened, it's able to withstand the hardship. Um, it's able to make it through the less than ideal times. And, and faith is really no different. When we invest our time, when we spend some time with God in our faith, um, quick shameless plug, we're doing connecting with God. What that day is about is about figuring out how do you strengthen your own faith as well as what are some exercises that could be done that might help you spend time with God. That's the whole day, 9 to noon. Um, when those muscles are strong, uh, you're able to stay on course a heck of a lot better. Um, when I was a brand new Christian, I, 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 I drove this road of faith, or I ran this race of faith like uh, like somebody who deserved a DUI. I was like, zoom, zoom, zoom. And like, there were days where I was totally on fire, and then there were days where I'm like, ah, whatever. Um, and there was no steadiness to it. And I noticed that as I invest my life in following Jesus, I feel more and more like I'm on a freeway. Like, I'm on course. There's not a lot of turnoffs happening anymore. And, um, and it reminds me that, that most people I know who have left the faith, decided to go down another road to find a good life somewhere else, um, most of them haven't really quit. They never told me, like, man, I'm out. I read this thing about Jesus, or I heard this thing about Jesus, and I just decided to use a numbskull, and I decided to go somewhere else to do something else. Like, that's never the story that I hear. What I hear is that uh, there's just a something happened and there was this slow fade that began to happen. Like it just sort of drifted to the back of their mind and, and they went somewhere else. Um, and it still might even be important to them, but they don't know how to get back to it. Um, it's just sort of this vague memory. And so, perhaps on that last day, they will have life eternal with God because of the faith that they had. But they're not experiencing the joy now. They're not getting the life that I couldn't wait to leave Mexico to get back to. Uh, a life with God uh, that's full of joy. And so, so I'm thankful for Paul's tips. This, these ideas of, of getting a team around us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, heading there, and then investing in our faith to strengthen us. I had another thought while I was sitting in Mexico. My dad uh, had a house not far from where we were, like a couple hours away. And um, I remember when he bought it, he bought this plot of land and then he drove a trailer down there and I went down there with him and we stayed in trailers and we gradually built up first a little shade so that we could, we could sit in our lawn chairs in a little bit of shade, which is crucial in Mexico. And then we gradually built up a house. My, an actual house in it. And then we, we had electricity and running water that we, we put in. There was a lot of investment in, in building this place. And my dad always said that when he retired, he was gonna go live there. Like that was the dream, was to go live in this house in Mexico. And he never got to do it, he never did it. Um, and I used to think, I bet he didn't get to do it because he died of cancer at like 65, which was young, felt young. Um, he was in, in good condition and, and did a lot of hiking and stuff and then got sick. Um, but then it occurred to me, he had actually retired from teaching like 10 years earlier. And I was thinking while I'm down in Mexico, what did my dad do? And he was like super invested in, in Boy Scouts and mentoring. And he spent a ton of time with this, uh, with this Catholic food bank. He volunteered at it every week and and did anything he could for them. And he was going on like three or four trips a year with Habitat for Humanity, and he was building houses for the poor. Um, and he never really talked about it, but I wonder if my dad found something better than sitting on a beach in Mexico at the house that he built. Maybe he found life to the full um, with all of its hardships and difficulties that was worth going after. And, my hope and my prayer for each of us is that we come up with something better than the good life that we would come up with. That we would trust God 
and let him come up with something even better and that we would fix our eyes on him and follow him into it and that we would do it together. So, can we do that? Attempt to do it this week and this month and this year and this life. God, uh, we need you. We don't even realize how much we need you, but we need you because we're not going to find a good life on our own. So we put our trust in you. Thank you for these people that you've put around us. Thanks for other sources of strength for when we feel weak. Thank you for the picture of Jesus who went through difficulty to find the joy in eternal life that is found at your right hand. Let us be like him. God, help us to strengthen and grow in our faith so we are deeply connected with you even through the difficulties. We love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you.